I remember a woman I worked with, she was in her 70s and she was entering a new part in her life and she really wanted to write a book. But her big frustration was when she would have to go back each day and reread the chapter because she couldn't remember what she had written. And she felt like it was such a waste of her time. So I started working with her and her psychiatrist to help manage and help find that right dose of medications for her. And I still remember this day when she we got on the phone during one of our sessions and she said, oh my goodness, I remembered what I wrote because now her medications were at the right amount where she could actually remember the past that the day before that she had written and she could start from there and move forward. ADHD Rewired, episode 96. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to ericktivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to ericktivers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Hey there, ADHD Rewired listeners and community members. This episode was released December 29th, 2015. So if you're one of the 800 or so listeners who tend to listen on the first day, you can have the added satisfaction knowing that you were listening to this episode on my birthday. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh man, it's Eric's birthday, I didn't even get him anything. Relax. The only thing that I really want is for you to have a great day. But if that's not enough and you are really inclined to to get something for me, today would be a great day to finally leave a review on iTunes. You know, if you've been thinking about leaving that review for, for weeks or months or longer, how cool would it be if you, the ADHD Rewired listener, could work together with the rest of the other ADHD Rewired community? and pull together 35 new reviews on iTunes. Right now, there are 265 reviews. 35 reviews. Is that too much to ask? It's my birthday. I'm 35 today. Come on. All right. I know it's my birthday, but I got some gifts for you too. If you missed last week's webinar, join me Wednesday, December 30th, at 1.30 Central Time for high-tech and low-tech solutions to supercharge your productivity. You can register at ADHDrewired.com. Just click the webinar icon on that page or click the link that is in your podcast app. And no, there will not be a video replay of this webinar. So if you're interested, I hope to see you there. If you are interested in participating in the recording of the 100th episode, yes, it's happening, the 100th episode of this podcast, click the link at ADHDrewired.com that says join episode 100. I will be doing two recordings on January 4th. Check the website or Facebook for more information. Man, I can't believe we're going to be at episode 100. All right. The next ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group is just around the corner. Early registration pricing ends January 8th. Go to coachingrewired.com to learn more and to schedule a free 20-minute consultation and screening with me. That's all I have for you. Now, enjoy the episode. We have an excellent, excellent show for you today, Um, especially, I would say the second half especially is great. Lori Dupar uh, and I, so I kind of step into her office in a sense, and um, I share with her some of the things that I've been going through with medication, and she kind of does a, uh, almost a a medication consult with me. 
um, it's, I think, really helpful. I, uh, I share things that hopefully will be helpful for all of you as well, um, including some things that might be a little embarrassing to share, but I did it anyways, because if I'm not going to share it, because um, I want to give you basically the courage to talk to your doctors uh, about some of these things as well. So uh, enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am really excited to finally have on the show Lori Dupar, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to try to give you one anyways. So Lori is a senior certified ADHD coach. She's a certified mentor coach and a trained psychiatric nurse practitioner who specializes in ADHD. This year, she just launched the International ADHD uh, Coach Training Center, the IACTC, rolls right off the tongue. And uh, congratulations on that, because I know that's a, a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, she is an author, co-author of a number of very successful books. Um, and I'll just let her, I'll just go from there. And uh, Lori, fill in for us, who are you? Gosh, you know what? I I I, uh, I love the focus on the uh, on the ADHD, obviously, and I think that really does probably describe who I am and my and my work in my life. Now, when people ask me sort of who I am, I say, well, first I'm a nurse, which may surprise people because that was really sort of uh, my first calling, I guess, my first answer to what do I want to do, how do I want to make a difference in the life, and before I became a nurse, I tried everything, and nursing was the last thing I wanted to be, and that was what. I ended up pursuing as a degree. Um, And then I actually have to say in there, I'm a mother next because uh, that really does play into who I developed and eventually came as a coach. Um, And the coach is certainly a role that I've taken on for the last 13 years, but the other two actually are equally as important and still um, provide a lot of uh, uh, background and understanding, I think, for when I'm coaching or working with clients or doing trainings at the IAC Center. So yeah, I I absolutely adore what I get to do. A lot of people would say I work way too much, and you and uh, I so both. I, oh, you and I both. They would say you work too much as well, Eric. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah working on it. It's a great yeah. It, it, it's very hard <laughs> to stop. I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard to stop doing that, right? When you love what yes. you do. Yes. Yeah. And I, there's days certainly when I'm tired, days when I'm ready to close my computer, turn off the phone, um, you know, turn on a, 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 you know, a really gray B Netflix, but, uh, or absolutely go out with friends, travel, all that kind of stuff. But I truly, truly love what I do. And it is, it's hard to turn it off at the end of the day. Let's just start with a mild tangent. Um, What's your like favorite thing on Netflix right now? Or something you watched recently? I'm actually watching, now I, I, I'm terrible, I, I, like I can remember faces, but the names of some things, it's called um, The Midwives. Okay. Do you know that one? I, I think I've heard of it, but I haven't seen okay. it. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a show that's set in the 1950s in England, or London, I believe. And they are um, some, and maybe I relate to it because these are women who are very young um, nurses, and they are actually, this is an era where a lot of children being born right before birth control in that particular part of the world. And they um, have relation, they have a group of women who are very, who are going out and helping and serving in this community, delivering babies. So that's sort of the background of it. And then they have these wonderful personalities and stories of these, of these young nurses, as well as the nuns that they live with. So. Ah, it sounds very interesting. And I, and I do recall someone else telling me about that show because that plot line okay. sounds very, very familiar. Yeah. Um, tell, share with me and, and the listeners, um, what exactly is a psychiatric nurse practitioner? Because I, I don't mm-hmm. think, I think it's almost maybe similar uh, to a social worker. Like it could be like, that could be so many things. And I don't think people like re- really understand what a social worker can do because yeah. there's so many things that they do. Um, right. Tell us about what that, that part of your training is and what that means. No, I think that I actually appreciate that question a lot, Eric, because, um, and actually I, I always, I was talking with someone the other day who was explaining to me that they were a realtor, not a real estate agent. And there's those certain professions that 
there is a very big distinction. And if you don't know it, um, I, well, first, probably you're not getting the service that you, you might not be getting the service that you need. And I always, I never want to insult someone by using a term that's not appropriate for um, a particular person's role, especially when they've, they've achieved that particular goal. So a nurse, most nurse practitioners, um, there's so many different levels where a nurse is thrown into that particular title. It used to be nurses trained in hospitals. So most of them had trained for two years in a hospital and they were actually um, graduated from a particular hospital. That was how they were trained. And then mm-hmm. it went into the graduate or went, went into the academic setting, no longer in the hospitals, but in an academic institution. And even at that point, nurses could still become a registered nurse with a two-year degree. Um, And the key there was that they still passed the same exam that a nurse who, for whatever instance, decided to go onto a four-year bachelor's program. Um, So there's still some nurses out there that have two-year degrees, but because they took the same test that qualified them as a nurse, they would be considered a registered nurse. That's the registered nurse piece. There's also a licensed practical nurse. That's a a more of a hands-on, I wanna say lower level of uh, more of a day-to-day handling of what's happening with with patients. Um, Nurses assistants, which again, sort of uh, assist a nurse in doing things perhaps on the, the floor and other capacities. Nurse practitioners have gone on to get an advanced degree, which is typically a master's program level. Um, And at that particular level, they can specialize, which is actually required that you specialize in a particular type of nurse practitioner. Um, As a nurse practitioner, my training is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. So anybody else out there has been trained in this, what it means is you know everything that all the family nurse practitioners know, because that's part of who you are. There's a very holistic approach to this. When I'm working with someone, I'm not just paying attention to maybe some of the disorders of their mind, but I'm also recognizing how that affects their body. So we went through all the training that the family nurse practitioners um, went through. And then we had that additional training that included um, the psychopharmacology of, of, um, or the medications that are used with um, psychiatric disorders, the diagnostic processes, all of our clinical hours were spent in a psychiatric setting, that sort of thing. Hmm. So um, now, are you uh, with that degree, with that being an advanced nurse practitioner, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, are you able to prescribe medication? Is that a state by state? It's it's a state by state. Each state has um, a, a little bit different rules um, and each state has different guidelines for how their nurse practitioners can work in most states. Um, and one of the reasons that I went on and got my nurse practitioner degree, and I have it in the state of Washington, was because I wanted to, it wasn't because I wanted this power of being able to diagnose or prescribe. I wanted that advanced knowledge. I knew there was something more, and I wanted to be able to um, work with patients in a way that I could do that independently. And the state of Washington supports that um, nurse practitioners um, practice independently of a psychiatrist. In some states, which can be confusing, nurse practitioners do have to work under the guidelines of a psych- of a psychiatrist. They have to have their orders and their prescriptions signed off by a psychiatrist. Um, and you'd have to go state by state to find out how that is working for you. But uh, for most nurse practitioners, they go into that particular role because they want to have that independence of being able to work with work with their patients um, in a particular way. We also have a lot of training, which surprises people, a lot of training in the therapeutic models as well. That's a whole be- big piece of it, because as nurse practitioners, again, we're looking at this holistic piece and recognizing that people don't necessarily just want um, medications um, when they come in and to see a provider. What they may also need is some sort of um, a verbal therapeutic support for their clients. So a nurse practitioner can decide, do I want to do a, have a practice where I'm focusing mostly on medication management, which is definitely needed out there. We know that there just don't seem to be enough people who can, um, who are good at doing that particular That's job. That's true. Yeah. Um, but also there's, a, there's um, for me, one of the most rewarding parts of, of not only being a nurse, but certainly as a nurse practitioner is this ability to get to know my clients and to be able to help support them in other areas of their lives. And that's why actually I added coaching to my particular role set. And really that's primarily what I do. I use a lot of the, um, I use a lot of the, the expertise, a lot of the experience, a lot of that education from my nurse practitioner days in my coaching right now. So you began as a, as a psychiatric nurse practitioner 
uh-huh. added coaching to to the toolbox and then uh-huh. decided this is uh, I really like this toolbox and so then now you use the the your training as a nurse practitioner as a tool in your coaching yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Yeah. I mean, it's in some ways that's sort of similar to to what I do. I, I wear multiple hats as I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, but I also do a lot of coaching, and it's you know, right. it's it's. Right. I mean, I don't think you, we ever really take one hat off and put the other hat on because I think that we are right. integrated people. You know, so we take that knowledge yeah. and and we're just aware of uh, where one thing ends and the other kind of begins. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really think it is. Um, I know that people thought I was nutso when I said, no, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, was so impressed when I did my training. I did my coach training at the um, at the uh, Coaches Training Institute in San Rafael in California. I was so impressed with How that. How long model. ago was that? Oh, gosh, in 2002. Okay. So long time ago. Um, and I didn't do the training to become a coach, which was sort of a funny story. I never really wanted to be a coach. Um, I had actually moved from overseas. I had lived in Washington State. I moved over to Australia with my family. My husband had a job for there for a few years. And then we moved back to the States and ended up in the Sacramento area. So I was in a state where sort of what I described to you, the nurse practitioners worked in a capacity where the psychiatrists needed to sign off their orders. And I wasn't comfortable with that. I had worked independently. I didn't want to go back to that model. I also had a son who had been diagnosed years before with ADHD, and I wanted to find a provider for him. So I went to a meeting. It was actually a CHAD meeting and um, in the area of CHAD chapter. And there was a woman up there talking about this thing called coaching. I thought, oh, my gosh, I've been in mental health for 30 years. What is coaching? Mm-hmm. I've never heard of it. Um, but as I listened to her, I said, well, this is sort of interesting. So I actually asked her afterwards how she got her training, how she got to what she was doing and found out that there was a training program, a really reputable coach training program, really literally in my backyard in um, San Francisco area. And I went there really because I got a weekend off. My husband was home. I had more, my four kids weren't there and I could stay in this little hotel room by myself. Well, why did you become a coach? I was bored. I was bored. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had no, a weekend off. I had the weekend off. I was just going to, you know, weekend off. The husband was home. Ah, I was going to go down to San Francisco and just listen in. Nah. And I came home and my husband, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm doing this. And he's like, oh, no, here we go. I can. I know that voice. This is this is not, so there's this a is, pattern of uh, of Lori getting very excited about something. Yes, yes, yes. Once I once I once I decide it, it's like there is no turning back. And it was the best decision I made. And I couldn't even believe I did it. I went there sort of thinking, I, I'm all this in a bag of chips, right? I have a, I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been doing this. I've been helping people with their ADHD, I, you know, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into and best decision I ever made. Um, mm-hmm. The paradigm is very different. And like you started to say, Eric, it's hard for people to understand where the differences are between perhaps um, like either a nurse practitioner or a coach or a coach or a therapist. And then you, unless you really have that education in both and feed in both. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely, for years, I put a lot of my nurse practitioner training and expertise on the back burner. Um, And then I started to realize how much of what I knew with regards to diagnosis, with regards to medication was not talked about a lot. And so many of my clients were coming to me with issues around medication management, with finding the right medications for them, for um, wondering about one diagnosis over the other. And I started to think, well, this is sort of crazy. I have this expertise and it's something that I know is very valuable for me as a coach um, to be able to share that information with my clients. I wasn't diagnosing and prescribing my clients, but I was able to provide information for them that helped them to make the choices that they wanted to. So about five years ago, I actually started talking a lot more in the coaching community about ADHD medications. I actually teach a a course um, through my... um, a teacher course, a five week course for people just to find out really it's sort of soups from the nuts and bolts of, of, of how the brain works, how medications work, what the different medications are so they can make a choice. Cause there's just a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of confusing information. So when you're working with a client who's, uh, who comes to you for coaching and, uh, and they're, you know, very kind of green to all of this, they're, and yeah. and you're going to kind of present the the topic or the idea of medication. How do you mm-hmm. start that that conversation off? Mm-hmm. 
Well, typically what I might do is if a client comes to me and says, I've been diagnosed, I'll ask them, are you, have you been diagnosed with ADHD? Because some people haven't actually been diagnosed. That's okay. They just have ADHD, as you say, ADHD characteristics. If they have been diagnosed, I may ask them who diagnosed them. And they may tell me who diagnosed them. And then I will ask um, between, usually it goes like, oh, to the question certain around the line of if they've been diagnosed um, and uh, they were, and, and it's been a while ago, even just a few months ago, what have they done between that diagnosis and now to help improve their challenges or the symptoms they're having? So that'll usually bring up, um, maybe they've been using a planner, maybe they've been downloading certain apps that are helping them, maybe they have a reminder system they didn't have before. And I really see medications now as one of the tools that people can use for their, to help manage their symptoms and challenges of ADHD. So inevitably in there somewhere, there will be, oh um, yeah, I've been taking this medication. And I'll ask them, so what medication are you taking? But I want to know the dose because that helps me to sort of understand where they are in that process, at least sort of with the typical guidelines of, of what um, prescribers use. And then I may ask them, so how, how is that working for you? What difference has that made? Um, particularly what I'm listening for is if clients will say, I'm, it's make, yeah, it's make, I think it's making a difference, but I still have, people are still experiencing a lot of difficulty with impulsivity a lot of difficulty with focusing, and they're already taking medications, it's almost a red flag in my head to say, maybe it's not the right balance of things for you. Maybe it's some, something's not quite working for you here because people who are on that right dose, the right timing, the right type of medication will not be as challenged with those things uh, with or taking that, that correct type of medication for them. What's your, your response? Because I'm sure this comes up uh, as it does for myself. Uh, when I'm starting to work with a client who says, um, you know, I just want to do a, a, the, the all natural uh, approach. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't believe in medication. Um, well, how do you respond to those two things? Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you hear both of those often. I do. I do. Something else I was going to say, I, and I'll, I'll answer that, but I do want to say something else that sometimes surprises some people. I will have other people say, well, I was never diagnosed with ADHD, but I am taking, uh, you know, Ritalin or I am taking Concerta. And what is, and I, I want to just say to some of these, or these people who have been diagnosed, these people's like, shame on you, because they, they would not be prescribing these medications. You're not going to be taking a stimulant medication unless you have been diagnosed. That prescriber cannot continue to prescribe that unless there's a diagnosis. And I, and I think it's really a shame that that their provider didn't say to them, "You, I'm actually diagnosing you with this particular mm -hmm. um, condition and we're going to use medication to help treat it. So I, I just say that in general because I hear it more often than not. And it's surprising to me. And again, it doesn't, I, I'm not all about the label. It's just a word. It gives us an opportunity to talk about right, this. It's a starting right? point. Yeah. But to me, it's a shame when someone says, oh, I'm taking this medication, which is only prescribed for something like ADHD, but I haven't been diagnosed. I'm like, yes, you have. Go back and and um, because they can't prescribe it unless you have been mm -hmm. um, diagnosed. But yeah, I don't believe in ADHD medications. To me, I, I, I absolutely understand that. And the reason I do is because there are not a lot of people out there that are helpful when people are wanting to explore the option of medications. So there's a lot of um, unfortunate experiences with that. They, there's not a lot of people that are going to support individuals wanting to take that step. And, um, and it's a scary step for most people. No one wants to put something in their body, especially or, and if they're a parent, absolutely, their child's body, that they don't feel 100% about. It's a very scary thing. So when people are saying, I don't believe in medications, I typically go to a place where I just listen from you know, so tell me about that. What, you know, what's, what's your experience been that now you don't believe in medication, you know, that you're not believing in medications. Um, and typically what I find is that there has either been um, one, a bad experience. There's been some information um, that was very negative, very scary for them, or there is someone in their family or they know that's close to them that actually has been diagnosed and on medication. And probably again, it was not a well-managed medication um, situation and they that person had that experience. So that's what's coming up for them. But I, I know at that point, um, and this is really from my coaching, honestly, is that to change them or to have them 
believe something that, or change what they believe, it's not really the point's not helpful for them at that point. Typically what I will say is if, uh, you know, if they want to go the all natural route is to, um, and when we say all natural, um, I also want to check to see how many supplements they have sitting in their bathroom or their Mm -hmm. kitchen counter, because I have this saying is that plastic is not natural. It's not. And if you, all of those all of those supplements and many people who want to go natural are taking multiple, multiple supplements. That's not natural. Those are manufactured. And the reason you're taking them is for them to have an impact on your body, hopefully a positive impact. It's really no different than what you want for the medication, except there's probably a 10, five to 10 bottles of those. And really, I don't think most people know how those interact with each other. So to me, Yeah. To me, if all natural is not, you know, uh, natural does not come in a bottle is, is I have to have a blog about that. Um, it just doesn't. And I don't have a problem with people wanting to do that because I think I want to support them, whatever works for them, but I want them to understand that that's not natural. And one of the things that, that I do in this, in that conversation is I talk about, you know, I kind of come from the, the perspective of consumer information and so what does all natural mean? So, well, all, all natural feels good. Well, you know, that's, it's a huge market. It's, it's, and that's what it is. Ooh. It's a marketing phrase, all natural. I think uh, mm-hmm. Rick Green uh, said, well, dirt is all natural. I'll give you a handful of yeah. that. Uh, yeah, you know, right? it's, and so when we think about all natural, it's cool. We don't want to be putting these, these quote unquote chemicals in our body. As you, as you just said, a lot of these supplements, they're, they're engineered chemicals. I mean, they, they yeah. are. Um, and yeah. in fact, some may be even more dangerous, um, and partially because we don't know what they do because they're not researched uh, uh, exactly. rigorously like like the the right. frontline medications are. Right. So I think that there is a big kind of um, disconnect between what information is known in the literature and what's yes. out there uh, in yeah. the general public. Yes. Um, there yes. was just a, um, I don't know if you get the uh, Russell Barkley's ADHD report. Um, I love it because it's like the Reader's Digest version of all the research that's out there. He'll like feature like two like articles and then uh, he has research findings for that, that issue. And he'll have like, I don't know, six to eight different brief summaries of, of research that's usually uh, published ahead of press. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in this one I just got uh, yesterday, I was talking about um, the findings of fish oil. And they did a they first did a, a meta analysis um, of all the these studies that looked at that did randomized control studies and yeah. found there's a of all the the studies that used the randomized control kind of a, a methodology um, a total sample size of 22 people would fit the criteria of the you know kind of quote unquote good research on this and of those uh, 22 people zero impact. Zero impact of fish oil, and yet we're you know we're we're encouraging people to to take fish oil, and it's funny because I've I've seen the a lot of these studies that are that are really questioning the effectiveness of it. Now, I take fish oil. I'm also a believer in if you believe in placebo, then let it work for you. <laughs> but you know, it's like maybe it works if it's not harming me. I mean, hopefully yeah. that's you know the other piece of it that it's not harming right. me. Um, but I just think it's important to know, like we taking this this you know whatever the supplement is, what does the research say? And for a lot of it, yeah. nothing. Well, and I think you and I both know that there's. Um, it, I, I'm a I'm a scientist by you know, by background, by nature, I'm, I'm constantly asking questions, but there is a lot of contradictory uh, research out there. Um, and it's almost funny, even when we prove, uh, and I, I, I love the research when it comes to, so something like that right now, what does the whole ADHD community do as far as fish oil? We all have a pouring of the fish oil somewhere. I don't really know. Um, but it, it's not, probably not going to hurt you to take that, right? And if it helps, even in a placebo way, wonderful. Uh, but I think that a lot of times we are taking some of these supplements and the benefit is placebo. It's may not, um, or the studies, if you understood what the study was, really understand that it wasn't really very robust, meaning it didn't have a lot of of, of really solid evidence behind it. There, The statistics were few. They were a very few cases that benefited from it, um, a very specific case, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, I mean, just... I think just educating the consumer is is yeah. really important. Yeah. 
Um, Because, you know, it's like whenever I hear a comment about like, oh, parents just want to shove medication down their kids. It's like I've never, ever met a parent who would just say, oh, man, okay, okay, great. Let's give it to my kid. Like, that's never an easy decision. No. You know, so it's it's, it's an absurd belief. It is. Yeah. Or, and again, I don't know how these sorts of things get really perpetuated. And I'm sure there are some parents that whose children are very unmanageable and they are really quite desperate and they, but, um, and I'm not saying they're shoving medications down, but they're really needing something to help and they might be more willing. And I've had this conversation on some other, on with other people, but I said, parents are in a really tough position. If they start medications at first, they somehow fail because they didn't try all the other stuff. They aren't, you know, doing all the behavior management or modification or positive reinforcement and all that. So they're in the wrong. If they wait too long, they're in the wrong because then they didn't do what they needed to do fast enough. So parents are just, you know, and I was that parent. So you're just in this really awkward situation. Know that. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. My experience has, has never been that a parent is like, okay, great. I can't. Oh, good, good, good. My child was diagnosed with ADD, ADHD. She wears the medication. Mm-hmm. That's not what they're saying. They, you do not want to do that as parents. Um, that is not what's happening. No. You know, it's, it's, uh, when, when I'm working with that, uh, with families and parents in my office, um, you know, I, cause I try, try to also take some perspective and use some humor in, in my work. And I say, look, our goal as, as parents is to just to minimize how much we screw up our kids. Mm-hmm. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to yeah. like, look at things in hindsight and say, I wish I would have done it differently. Yeah you can't do anything about that. Like, don't be afraid to try something that's, you know, Mm -hmm. and don't beat yourself up for making a mistake. Like you now know better. So you're you're going to do better. Like be thankful for that mistake because it's informed what you're going to be doing now. Right. Right. Yeah. I always say a a perfect is it perfect is, um, you know, there, there's, well, there is no perfect parenting because perfect is abnormal, Mm -hmm. right? If I parented perfectly, that would be weird, right? Uh, That would be totally wrong. Or as a parent, you get a chance to do it again, most likely, you know, if you didn't like the way you did it, it's a learning opportunity. Okay, we're going to do it again next time. Um, Or not next time, not necessarily with the next child, but we know that situation is going to come again as a parent and child. So, yeah. Right. And and I even tell my clients that I work with that, you know, um, as a, as a therapist and that, you know, has a lot of training in kind of behavioral uh, interventions and, and they've worked a lot of board certified behavior analysts. So I, I understand like behavior change and I have done things and will continue to do things that I would tell my clients, I think that I just did. Don't, don't do that with your kid. That was, that, that's an example of what not to do. And I should, yeah, I do those things sometimes. And it's like at that moment, that's just where I was at. And it doesn't mean like I'm, proud of that moment but it's like i'm a human being and i'll always try to improve but i'm not going to beat myself up over you know it's like i know that that too much tv makes my son a little nutty um and there are times where i'm like no, letting him watch another show it makes my life easier and i'm just low energy that day and you know uh-huh. it's like and i try to just go for the more often than not make the better choice uh-huh. yeah yeah um so looking at uh um how do you help your clients with um, really tracking medication. So when we're looking right. at trying something new or changing medication, how do we evaluate right. yeah. uh, the effectiveness of, of a specific uh, treatment when it comes to medication? Yeah, um, it, it's a, that's a great question um, because mostly people, the way that it's tracked is every three weeks or every month where you walk back into your prescriber's office and they say, so how's it going? And I have so many clients that come to me and say, I, what am I supposed to say? Like, it's like they are expecting me to say something. I'm not sure. And then when they leave, the, the last thing that the prescriber says, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, but I hear it over and over again, or else I just, these are the clients that come to me. They'll say, okay, just make sure you're eating and you're not losing weight. Right. And we're good. Or if you know, make sure you're sleeping and, and not losing weight. And the, and then, so the parent or even the adult walks out and they're like, okay, these are two things left in their head. Um, and it's sort of crazy because it's not, uh, they don't really know what else should I be noticing. And that's why, for instance, I mentioned to you, if I'm talking with a client who is still struggling significantly with their ADHD challenges and they're taking medication, and those are the medications that, that um, at the right dose, taken at the right time on the right medication would really have minimized challenges, especially like impulsivity or paying attention, those sorts of things. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious as to whether or not they're on the right medication. So one of the things that I do 
is when I start working with someone, I actually have a tool, it's called a medication log. I could probably call it something else. It's a little prettier, but it's actually a medication log. And I made design this basically because what I found out was that when I was working with clients, they were started on a medication. Mostly they didn't even know what dose it was. They didn't, they couldn't remember when they were taking it, which is to me sort of the anti-definition of what I call addiction is not being able to remember the medication to take it. Most clients do not remember to take their medication from one dose to the next, from one day to the next but they didn't know when they were taking it. They may or may not know the dose of it. Um, and they weren't even sure if it was working for them. So I created just, it's just a sort of a, a tool that they can use where they can actually track, okay, this is a medication I'm taking. This is the dose I'm taking it at. This is and and chart. Okay. These are how many times a day I'm taking it. And then down on the sort of um, as a table as well, it has some other symptoms that most people would experience being different in a positive way, if they were taking the right medications, things such as what's my energy level? What's my mood? Um, what's my, how am I sleeping? Um, how have I been able to focus? And it's sort of an opportunity for them to, to rate that from one to 10. So there's a way to sort of systematically uh, to log these, mm-hmm. log these items in. They don't have to do it forever and ever. Cause I know that as ADHD, we're not going to do that, but if they do that, and they take it into their prescriber, because this is the language that prescribers understand. They understand you're taking this amount, you're taking this dose, this is what's happening. Okay, now I know what to do. That's the information that they're looking for, but we don't know what they're looking for. So this log sort of helps us not only create something that's useful for us to see, wow, I'm really not feeling that energetic, or I'm having trouble remembering what I did this morning or what I did yesterday. In fact, when I've used this for folks, Eric, what they tend to notice, I mean, they'll come with a specific challenge. For instance, I remember a woman I worked with, she was in her 70s and she was entering a new part in her life and she really wanted to write a book. But her big frustration, she's very talented, big frustration was she would have to go back each day and reread the chapter because she couldn't remember what she had written. And she felt like it was such a waste of her time. So I started working with her and her psychiatrist to help manage and help find that right dose of medications for her. And I still remember this day when she we got on the phone during one of our sessions and she said, oh my goodness, I remembered what I wrote because now her medication grew at the right amount where she could actually remember the past that the day before that she had written and she could start from there and move forward. Um, some people are taking their medications too early or, or excuse me, too, or at a time that they're wearing off too early in the day. So a lot of people take their medication so that the ben- positive benefits of the medication is active during academic hours. But what's happening is that the medications are wearing off after school or even before school is out. It's not uncommon for me to work with clients where that they're struggling with these last two periods of the day. And when we talk about it, it's not that they don't like those particular classes or that particular topic, but as I work with clients, what I'll find is that, gosh, that's when the medication is wearing off. So it's not lasting long enough. Or they'll go home and the challenge will be trying to get homework done. I mean, how many people have you heard say like homework is like a, a you know, like a five, six hour ordeal? Right. It's not homework. Yeah. It's a battle. It's you're, you're going it's to battle, war yeah. to try to, every single it's day. War, and right. it's, yeah, it's a war every single day. And a lot of that is because the medication is worn off. And a lot of people don't understand or parents don't understand there can be a shorter acting medication that the child can take after school to help them be able to refocus to get that homework done. I mean, because I, I want to say kids, students, you know, students are people too. They need to have opportunities for social life. They need to have opportunities to pursue, pursue other things other than homework. Um, some people take the medication too late. And what I mean by that is that they're taking it as they're heading out the door with this sort of disaster behind them of planning or disorganization. They forgot the, ho- the homework wasn't put in the backpack, the, the, the uh, you know, report that needed to be and, and try to speak of these things yeah. in the realm of adults, if you could too, because that's, you know. Yeah, most- no, no, no. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah, the, 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 the report that you had to get due never got in the, um, never got in the, you know, in your, in your briefcase, you're in the, you're in the car and you realize you forgot your glasses. So you got getting, you're going back into the door and then you realize, oh my gosh, and it's just my glasses. There's my wallet sitting there. Okay. got to get my wallet getting back in the door. Um, oh yeah. I was supposed to make that appointment for my, for the doctor's appointment this morning. Okay. I'll do that when I get there. Um, that there's this chaos. We, we, we forget how important it is for us to be able to literally hit the floor with an ability to plan ability mm-hmm. to remember things. But so a lot of adults will uh, 
so when I ask them, when you take your medications and they'll say, well, I take it right as I'm heading out the door. And, and I, so, and then I'll ask them, so how does that work for you getting ready in the morning? Talk to me about that mm -hmm. and realize that a lot of the chaos that ensues afterwards in their day that they've forgotten to make a particular phone call. They've forgotten a particular report that they had done, but just didn't put in their briefcase or um, just an, an, a myriad of other things that, that, that inability to plan in the morning or sort of hold their thoughts around, what do I need for the day? Really just sort of through the rest of their day into utter chaos. Um, I have some specific questions I'd like to, to ask you uh, around mm -hmm. task initiation and task shifting. But before okay. I ask you this question, I have to shift to a break. So we're going to be it. right back. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD rewired for your free audiobook download. Early registration for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group will be ending soon. Before the price goes up or this group fills up, schedule a free 20-minute consultation with me. Go to coachingrewired.com. With the ability to pay over six months, there has never been a better time to invest in you. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. We are back with Lori Dupar. We're talking about medication. And uh, just before the break, uh, I mentioned that I wanted to uh, ask you about some uh, questions regarding task shifting and task initiation. Mm -hmm. um, so Selfishly, these are questions that I have for myself, but I know that if I have them, other people do too. Okay. Um, so I've been on medication uh, since I was diagnosed when I was 19 years old. I am, um, by the time this is released, uh, I'll be 35. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm an oldie, right? No, you're a baby. <laughs> um, and for me, all, like 35 suddenly feels like, I don't know, it feels like I've entered adulthood. I don't know why before that, it's like I'm emerging on adulthood. Because I don't know, it's it's just weird for me. I mean, it's totally tangentially, but it's just like in my head, I'm like, what? Like, I still feel like 18. Well, you'll feel 18 when you're when you're 40. I think you start to feel about 20 when you're about 50. That's so strange. It's so strange. It is. It is. Uh, yeah. Well, welcome to sort of adulthood. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's just not so bad. No. So I've been on medication for since I was 19. Um, for most of that period, I was on short acting Adderall, um, three, you know, three uh, dosages a day. Um, I would pretty consistently forget at least one of those doses. Um, and then I would get into that, that typical kind of rebound where I would just get so stuck in neutral. Um, like that's mm -hmm. like, so, and that's how I would describe pre-diagnosis. I would often be, just be very stuck in neutral. My, uh, my mom used to say to me, you'd rather put in more energy at staring at a wall than just getting started with your work. It's like, yeah, I, we didn't know I had ADHD then. Um, so over the last several years I shifted, uh, I tried, um, I, well, I, I had tried for a short period of time, uh, um, the extended release. And I didn't mm -hmm. find the same, uh, it just, it wasn't, I wasn't having a positive impact from that, but that was when I was in college. Um, so I went back to the short acting and then a couple of years ago, I said, you know, let me just try that extended release again. Um, and it was a great shift. It was, it really helped. I felt more consistent. It was, uh, uh, it went, worked really well for me. Uh, I was taking 60 milligrams of extended release XR for, for quite some time and having a really good uh, response to it with an, okay. and I would take occasionally an afternoon uh, dose of short acting, depending okay. on what I had going on. And then um, maybe eight months ago, a year ago or so, I started having a lot of anxiety. 
and it was so much so where I would, uh, so this is a total like ADHD with anxiety. So I would spend hours looking on like psychology today and looking at researchers for to, uh, doing research on finding a psychiatrist who may at least know like similar amounts of information about ADHD as I do. So I would spend like hours a day feeling anxious looking for a a, a doctor to, to go see um and then not making any decisions <laughs> i mean that's doesn't get much more adhd with anxiety than that does it yeah so yeah. i finally just pulled the trigger made an appointment and um i started been working with someone and we're trying a number of different things which i, I initially decreased the the adderall uh extended release uh to, to half that i was taking um, which really helped my anxiety. Didn't help the ADHD though. Um, I uh, when I started seeing this doctor, that we increased it back to fifty milligrams instead of sixty, um, and I was doing okay with that. Uh, and then we started uh, trying um, uh, some adding some non-stimulant uh, mm -hmm. into the mix. I started with Intuniv. Okay. Um, and that uh, that turned out very not good. Um, it so started slowly. I got when I got up to three milligrams of Intuniv, um, I uh, it was it was really bad actually. I I was having a really hard time uh, shutting my brain off and like in a different way than usual. Um, where I could like my brain would typically you know usually, usually listen to a podcast at night that I'll just fall asleep to. Um, cause okay. I need like one thing to kind of listen to and then my brain kind of follows that and I fall asleep. Um, mm. this, it was very different. I felt like both my mind and body, I was very restless. I couldn't fall asleep. And then I was getting anxiety about not being able to fall asleep, um, mm -hmm. which had never happened to me before. Like I've always had sleep oh. issues, but I've never uh -huh. had the anxiety of not being able to fall asleep. Cause my biggest sleep issue is typically just getting myself to get into bed, you know, cause I had that, that real bad case of one more thing itis. Okay. Right. So um, I had uh, um, just, it was really, really bad. I, I called my psychiatrist over the weekend uh, and I was like, something's got to change. This is not working for me. Um, right. So we started tapering down off of it. That was good. Um, we then, as we're tapering off of that, he added Stratera. So oh. I started taking uh, 60 milligrams of Stratera, which I know is a very low dose um, and doing pretty well with that. Um, and then last week increased to 80 milligrams of Stratera. Mm -hmm. um, and this week I've been off. I've been low energy. I get to my office. I, I'm having a hard time activating, uh, doing the things that, that I, that, um, I know, I know what I need to do. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of going through the, yeah, doing like the paper shuffle. I'm just going from one thing to another, not really getting my primary goals, um, accomplished. Um, now my sleep's been a little bit, n not as good as, as, uh, it has been, but not like where I'm going into some major sleep deficit. Um, do you think that it could be from the slight increase of Stratera or do you think that maybe other stuff? So, yeah, I have a couple questions for you. Um, so right now, if I haven't, if I understand it right, you're on 50 milligrams of the extended release Adderall. Yes. Okay. And you know, when it kicks in and you know, when it wears off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just one Adderall a day. Uh, yes. Yeah, so one, one, uh, so I take the 50 milligrams <coughs> mm -hmm. in the morning. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and you're on 50 of Stratera. Yes. Okay. And when do you take that? Uh, no, what is, uh, um, not 50. What did I just say? 80, 80. 80. Okay. And when do you take that? Um, I've been taking that, um, a little bit later in the morning because I because I, um um and I've already shared this on my podcast. I have some IBS issues. Um, okay. I spend way more t way too much time in the bathroom. Um, and okay. the reason the reason I talk about it here because I think it's important that people talk about it with their providers because um, mm -hmm. it's sort of this embarrassing thing. It's like really you're bringing that up. It's like yeah because it's it's impacts how we feel. Because um, right. I know for myself. Uh, when I used to work uh, for somebody else and I had to be at, at the office earlier than I would typically want to be, um, mm -hmm. I was in a rush and I couldn't 
take care of my, my bowels, then I would get backed right. up and then I'd get right. really mentally foggy. And I think it's important okay. to understand that process. Um, yeah. You know, Lori, just so people know, Lori has this look at her face like, I can't believe you're sharing this. No, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, hey, I'm a nurse. You, you, yeah, this is like, okay. Right, right. You know, I'm, I'm there's a difference between me it. sharing this just with you and you and like a few thousand plus listeners who are going to be yeah. hearing me sharing right, this right, with right, you. Right. Um, I love it because it's such, it's the reality of, it's very, very real. It's exactly, right. yeah. And that's, that's, that's why I share okay. it. Um, so, so you were taking it a bit later. Right. Okay. And so, cause I, cause so the first few days on um, when I started the, the trial of uh, Stratera, I was, I was getting kind of bloated and real, that kind of feeling of, of very like a nauseated feeling when I go to the bathroom. Um, mm-hmm. And then it's, and then it subsided. Mm-hmm. Um, after a couple of weeks of being on it. And then I increased uh, to the 80 and I, and I had that, that feeling again. Okay. Um, and then uh, interestingly, uh, yesterday or two days ago, I, I did a, a fast because I had to get some blood work done. So I didn't eat. Uh, I, I, t- I took my medication. I didn't eat, have any coffee or anything. Um, and I noticed that the, uh, the, that nausea feeling didn't occur on that, that day. Um, when you didn't take the medication? When I didn't, eat oh. um, so i took my my adderall i took my i also take vitamin d and, and uh as i mentioned uh fish oil in the morning right um and um so i um I'm trying to keep track of all this information in my head um so i see the working memory thing just go like what was i just saying um no i just so i asked you when you were when you were taking it. you said you took it a little bit later in yeah the so i didn't have the, the, that so i was tr- i'm trying to shift the when i'm taking the stratera so you take it after i had my like morning smoothie which is like right before i work out mm-hmm. uh now i'm actually trying to um the last few days i've been having my smoothie while working out so i can try to uh um maybe uh just change the digestive process a little bit okay um and then i take the stratera usually around somewhere between nine to ten o'clock in the morning okay okay one of the things that's not always understood or explained about stratera is that it works very different than our typical stimulants like Mm -hmm. adderall is a typical stimulant it works much more in fact it's a remake of an old antidepressant um that has been cleaned up because now we have the technology to do it but it still retains some of the properties of its old, its like you know grandfather or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them being is that it oftentimes takes several weeks for it the, the dosage to build up in your system so that you know if you're getting the benefits of it. It's not like the Adderall where you take it and really that day or the next day you start to notice is this enough? Is it too much? It can take a little bit longer with Stratera, so it works very different than the um, Adderall medication. The other thing is that a really common side effect, Eric, of the of Stratera is fatigue and also GI upset. And it again is sort of a just a little bit of its um, a little bit of it still sort of more common side effect of that particular type of medication. So a lot of people feel that GI upset and also a real increase of fatigue when they start taking Stratera. And we typically take it during the day because that's when we take it with, that's when we take our other stimulant medications. It sort of makes sense from that level. The thing is you can take Stratera at night because it works 24 hours in your system. It doesn't just like kick in when you take it. What you're doing is you're building up the blood level of Stratera. So it's working all the time. A lot of people who have been having troubles with it in the morning, if it's adding benefit in some other way, once they start taking it at night, because it also tends to have a little bit of um, sedating factor. Um, notice that the GI upset piece of it tends to diminish because they're sleeping through it. And they also sleep better because it also it tends to make them just a little bit more drowsy or fatigued. Does that make sense? So that's yeah. one thing that you could do if you're, you know, if you're considering that. The other is, of course, as a coach, I would want to know, okay, what happened a month, a month ago or what, a year and a half ago or whatever it was when you started to have the anxiety. Mm-hmm just to sort of know what was going on with that. When you've had anxiety in the past, what worked to help that? I mean, if there was, if there's really a significant difference, something that's happening physically for you, what has worked in the past to help Mm -hmm. reduce the anxiety? Um, The other is that sometimes when we have the anxiety along with the ADHD, which is very, very common, and it's oftentimes sort of a borderline of uh, almost obsessive compulsive, 
type of anxiety, which a lot of us have, uh, that it can be helpful to actually treat that with some form of an uh, antidepressant that also has anti-anxiety qualities to it. Um, because then again, we're dealing directly with the neurotransmitter that is um, involved with anxiety, which is a serotonin mm -hmm. neurotransmitter. So uh, the, I hope, did that, that answer your question or just sort of explain some of the options? So might be taking it later, taking it at night, right before you go to bed, the Stratera, mm -hmm. to see if that makes a difference, knowing that you still may not have that dose quite adjusted for yourself. If after you're on it and those still side effects, GI side effects and the sedative side effects feel like they haven't um, diminished for you, I would actually consider adding, going and asking your doctor to add some some sort of a um, antidepressant, mostly for the anxiety component of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the because uh, I, I definitely can tell the difference between just overwhelm um, and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, what's really interesting is since I've, uh, you know, I've, when, when I was in grad school, uh, so when I first learned how, uh, the, how to do meditation, um, and I, I, uh, so I learned how to look at that, that those feelings of anxiety in a very mindful, non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. And what was kind of paradoxical about that is that I would ha be, I would have these kind of low to moderate levels of anxiety and I wouldn't overthink it. I would just notice it. And then it got to this point. I was like, you know, that's happening a lot and it's starting to increase. So I was, it was really kind of there, but it wasn't like bothering me. So it was just like, there's just, there's anxiety. There's a little heart racing, you know, it's like, okay, th there it is. And I think because I learned some of those coping strategies, like yeah. it, it was like, it didn't register that, oh, I should be paying attention to this because this is, mm -hmm. it's been kind of growing and growing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I may, may have had some, uh, uh, chronic anxiety throughout you know, my life kind of comes and goes. Um, so I, I don't think it was situation on my last kind of episode of, of anxiety. Just, oh. it was just kind of like, you know, what, whatever's going on internally. Um, okay. because there have been times where I can clearly, like, I was, remember I was talking to a friend a while back about feeling overwhelmed and feeling very anxious. And she's like, well, you know, she, she kind of uh, encouraged me to, to, she basically gave me the same advice to get to my clients. Well, let's do a mind map and get everything out of her head. And so I did that. And I'm like, oh, that's why I'm anxious. I have way too much on my plate right now. And so it's like, and I can tell, I, for me, I can feel that difference between just like the worst yeah. anxiety coming from and, right. uh, and overwhelm. Um, right. But task shifting has always been one of my greatest challenges. Um, cause I'm a very kind of state based person. And so that's whether I'm shifting from one thing to the next or, uh, uh, shifting from leaving my office to going home to even mm -hmm. like after we're done with this, uh, this call, I need to, cause I am like two weeks behind on this. I need to go get a haircut. And so for me, this is like a big challenge cause I'm like, all right, I'm at, I'm at the office right now. That means I'm gonna have to go like to, to, you know, leave my office, but I don't typically leave my office during the day go get the haircut then I may actually have to then go like home and shower quickly and then come back to it. And like, and I'm, I'm glad I'm saying this out loud because hopefully that will actually help me get my butt out the door after we're, we're done here. Um, cause I'll, there'll be times where I'll be, right, I'm going to do it today. And then it's like, well, I'll do it after I do this task and then that task. And then I still don't have a haircut, you know? And so it's like, I'm very like aware of, okay, it's like, it's this internal mechanism in my brain. It's like, yeah. uh, it's, you know, it's that typical ADHD thing. It's like, I know what I got to do. My brain is not cooperating. And so I look at it a very, in a very kind of neurological way. Like what's, what are the mechanisms in my brain that can help with task shifting? Task shifting. So you're, and you're, and, and, and even as a great example today, what you're going, okay, I need to see to get my hair cut. And it sounds like it's a fairly simple task. Okay. Just get up, go do it and come back. But what you find as you start to do it, that there's this, you're these like, obstacles or small hills or bumps or whatever. Um, and so part of it is I'm wondering when we're doing tasks, it, it might even tie into what you're talking about earlier, Eric, is that it seems like a simple task, but really it's not necessarily a simple task. As you were talking about, I was like, yeah, okay. It's not just going to get a haircut for you. It's actually having to get up having to change your pattern of behavior, having to maybe even add a shower in there somewhere and come back. Um, and, and I think uh, an overwhelm comes at a different place for different people, but that can feel a bit overwhelming. Like I'm not really wanting to do that right now because it's much more 
comfortable with what where I am right now. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It doesn't mean that you won't do it. Some of the things that I have found is first, just like you just did going, okay, what is really involved with this? Like, I'm a big boy. I've had haircuts before. <laughs> Like, I, I mean, I don't have a lot of hair, but I still have to get the ones, the one I have left. I, I, I got to get those cut. Right. Right. You know, it's, you yeah. know, transitions for me, they're just exhausting. But yeah. I've also noticed that there have been times where it's like, I, I have something to do and I just get up and go do it. And I'm always curious about that. I'm like, what's going on internally that allowed that to seem almost effortless where in other times it feels like it requires so much effort to make that transition. I think it has a lot to do with part of it is the part of our brain that allows us to shift or not. Um, again, I would go back sort of to medication because medication typically helps with that executive function, being able to shift from one test to the next easier. Um, because what happens otherwise is that we get hyper-focused on what we're doing or we're content in what we're doing and moving into something that's either the unknown or not as comfortable. Why would we want to go there? Honestly. And if we do shift into something more easily from one task to a next, that second task probably is more interesting, is easier um, in some particular way. So especially if you notice that shifting tasks changes depending on the task, um, again, part of it, if you're if it's a constant challenge, if it feels like you're just literally pulling teeth to try and get yourself from one task to the next, one is to just, you know, if you're using medication as a management strategy, notice that. Is, this, is it actually working enough? There are other things that I may not be getting um, from the medication. It might be an adjust, adjustment with that because it can take a long time away from us mm -hmm. when we're trying to transition. Another is, again, not to minimize what the transition is and not to also make it into a big mountain either, but recognize, okay, well, this is what it means. Um, I have to do this and this and this. Um, it may, you know, some people do well to put some sort of reward at the at the end of a transition of a transition. Uh, for instance, uh, I've, I've recently moved up to the Seattle area. And one of the things I've been needing to get done is to get my license and my car registered. And um, it was a huge task. And it, I didn't think it would take that long, but I had to get out of my house like you and I had to do it during a certain time of the day. Um, it's my experience with getting all that sort of stuff taken care of in California is a nightmare. So I was aware at some point that that was a, as that I was fighting that particular uh, demon as well. Uh, but someone told me something that made a lot of sense is that I actually then plan for it, which may sound, and it wasn't just the transition time. It wasn't the time that I needed to get out of my office, out to the door into the driver's place, but I, which I had estimated sort of was going to be around an hour, maybe even an hour and a half. I actually plotted out of my take a three hour time span to get this done because I knew if I did that and I started, then I would allow at, allow plenty of time for this task. And as it turned out, by the way, anybody who lives in Washington and has been to any California driver's license, it's like it was like going into nirvana. It was peaceful. The people were pleasant. It took me 15 minutes in at and out. At a government out. agency? At a government agency, getting my license. And at the end, and I went in there, to, you know, sweating, totally prepared that this was going to be a nightmare uh, process because that's what I, I've, I've been through. And at the end of that, I had, I um, wanted to do a little bit of grocery, or not grocery, but a little Christmas shopping. So I said, if I get this done, I get to do this, this Christmas shopping. So again, I use multiple strategies to help shift myself. But I think one of it is not minimizing that it was a big shift, mm -hmm. maybe even realizing there's these sort of rules that we have about that particular shift. For some people, rules that are unpleasant, like for me, getting going into a government agency on a Friday afternoon is not going to be pleasant. And it turned out to be a very pleasant experience. Um, also allowing enough time for that to happen because we do tend to underestimate the time um, in order to make that transition. And then offering a reward for ourselves that is, it, I'll admit, it's like a bit of a carrot that's dangling out there mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, um, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's so interesting to just, you know, I think about what the, for myself, one of the best strategies that I use to like just get myself home um, is my wife will call me before she goes to bed because she goes to bed uh, as soon as she puts our son down. And she'll just ask me what time. And what she's asking me is what time should she set the alarm for? Because I have to be home before that alarm goes off. So it's using a little bit of a, you know, creating a sort of an adrenaline provoking situation because I don't want to wake my yeah. family up. And so it's right. it's such a good strategy that works so well for me. 
Um, yes. Over the last week, I've been cutting it dangerously close. Uh, <laughs> like we're literally, I, I turn the alarm off, and the, in the time changes at that moment to when the alarm would have gone gone off. Like I, I come in the house, I still have my like hat and gloves and everything on, and I'm like, oh dear. Okay, so it's but but it works. You're just a bit of a thrill seeker, there, Eric. Maybe, maybe. I, you know, it's how yeah. I, that's how I get my. It's it's a safe way to get my adrenaline uh, fix. It used to be. It is. You know, I used to do a lot of mountain biking and I would do things that, that I sh- probably shouldn't do. Um, so oh. it's, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the uh, let's see, the week before I started my, an internship when I was in grad school, I flew into a tree on a, a mountain bike and I had the, the, um, the bruising left the pattern on my chest and stomach of the tree bark. <laughs> <laughs> That must have been interesting. I'm sure Alan Brown could relate to that right now. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> his road, road, his road rage thing, yeah, that he's got going on. Yeah, right. Wow. So you know, I've just been very curious though, just about the whole process of of specifically <laughs> task shifting, because uh, even when it's something yeah. that I want to do, even if I know that I'm going to go go somewhere that I actually enjoy, and I know that when I'm there, like I'm going to have a good time, mm-hmm. you know, it's like. Uh, I find all these things, you know, it's like, oh, I'll be okay. I'm just going to stay home. It's like, where did that come? Is that because I'm old now that I'm almost 35? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's definitely the 35 thing, the 35 feeling 18 thing. I think part of it are really, I think part of it, again, if we look at it from a neurobiological standpoint is, and, and you can look, is it the medication working? It's not because typically those transitions are easier with the medications. If, if, uh, if you're getting the benefits, full benefits of the medication otherwise, then it may be actually not even realizing that there's a bit of overwhelm that's happening in there, even though it's a fairly small task. Mm-hmm. Um, and even just sort of bringing that to our awareness, to go, okay, wow, there's a little overwhelm there. No wonder I'm resistant because I'm a lot like you. I think we behaviorally, we're going to do things based on what feels good and what doesn't feel good for us. Um, and then if we know that there's some behavioral sort of objection to doing things or some bad experiences in the past or um, then to, you know, switch things up a little bit, allow ourselves more time for that transition, uh, write it down, get it out of our head. So we know, oh, okay, these are the steps. And in fact, it's not completing this whole step or making this full transition over here, but really the first transition is to, um, and I'm thinking of, you know, make sure I have my keys in my hand. I'm just thinking for you, mm-hmm. Eric, it's just, you know, when she says and says what time that that's not just make, making sure I know what time am I supposed to be home, but also that, okay, now that's also my time that my keys in my hand, because typically there's a lot of other steps that we're not paying attention yeah. to. And it just sort of gets us almost moving without even knowing it. Because mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. that was that very, very first step. Yeah. It is. It's, yeah. It's, it's so funny, you know, and, and I know that there's lots of ADHD coaches and, and therapists, you know, that also have ADHD. And so I think it's so important that, that, you know, as someone who has ADHD, that we're talking to other people because it's like, you know, a doctor can't be their own patient and a therapist right. shouldn't be their own client. You know, no. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's it, the behavioral management of ourselves uh, versus it's like, you know, my office is, it's, you know, not super organized, but it's, it's been better, but I can help somebody else organize way better than I can organize myself. And that's just, that, sure. that's so common, uh, you know, yeah. with a lot of us. Um, Laura, this has been one, like, thank you so much. Are you, you going to send me a bill? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, no, it, but yeah, my gift to you. <laughs> tell us, uh, before I let you go, tell us a little bit about your uh, the new training center that you just oh, uh, launched, because yeah. that's exciting. It's very exciting. Um, it's one of those things, Eric, where I realized I've been doing this for probably 10 years or building up the pieces for it, and it simply became an uh, opportunity and the time for me to uh, to do it m- myself. I have a lot of experience. I've trained coaches. I've um I have some unique approaches because of my background, and I really wanted to create a program that um, really focused on a, um, again, bringing in my expertise in um, some certain areas, things that we've been talked about today, but I really wanted to focus on some things that weren't being talked about in the ADHD community um, and, and preparing coaches to work with, with clients, things like um, diversity, things like the influence of culture. Um, the ability to be able to coach people of different ages. Typically, a lot of coaching is taught 
to work with people that are adults or maybe people specialize in working with younger people versus working with someone who's an adult. And what I'm finding the longer I do this is that even in populated areas, our coaches are oftentimes the only resource and they really want to have that breadth of understanding um, what ADHD is like for persons of multiple age groups, um, including families, um, senior citizens, all of that sort of stuff. Also, I'm super excited about that we are, I'm uh, bringing in experts from throughout the ADHD community, uh, sort of like a guest expert series to enrich the curriculum that is already being created for our students. And uh, that's very exciting for me because, you know, I like to work in a community and create that community. And I know that there are folks out there that have expertise that I don't. And I think it really benefits um, the students to have that. And the other thing that we're doing that's a bit different as well is focusing a lot on the business building of your coaching business, because you can be a well-trained coach and a great coach, but if you're not sure how to get clients, if you're not sure how to um, promote yourself so that people know this is a service you're providing, your clients can't find you and you can't find them. So that's a huge emphasis of what we're doing. Um, and it's very exciting. We're about halfway through our first course, our new, our next course. We already have some um, students signed up for it. starts in March. Um, so if people are interested, I invite them to go over to the IX Center and check it out. And what, What's the website know. for that? It's iactcenter.com. And there's a, you can schedule a time to talk with me. I'd love to have a conversation with you and answer any questions you might have about it. Um, there's some downloadable assessment forms, a form that says, are you ready to be an ADHD coach? Um, I really believe, we really believe the IAC Center that coaching is a calling, that people who didn't even know about coaching, sort of similar to you and I, who might've started on different paths, all of a sudden heard about it, saw it and went, oh my goodness, that's something I want to do. I want to help other people not struggle as much as I was. And that is really what we're about. So, well, it's congratulations uh, uh, to this venture because I know it's, you know, in, in the uh, in, in my kind of professional bucket list, uh, I would like at some point to create a, a training center of some kind because I just I oh. love to teach because it's like, you know, if I can help clients one on one or even in, in workshops that I give. Right. You know, that's that's one thing. But if I can teach other professionals how to how to also you know, know what I know and sort of do right. what I do. Like, right. I mean, that's then, yeah. then what I have learned will live on beyond, yeah. beyond yeah. me. Um, and yeah, that's, and it, yeah. And it's true. A lot of, a lot of people, especially from the education air, education domains, the health domains, um, therapeutic domains want to, want to simply add coaching to their repertoire. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, we're seeing a lot of students, um, join our program with those particular backgrounds. And because we're a virtual program and we, we focus on the cultural diversity, I'm very much aware that I may not be able to be in, in um, communities in Colombia, but I'm so excited and thrilled to know that I have a student that's joining us from Colombia that's gonna be able to take that message to the people in her village and do it in a way that's very honoring of that diversity and that That's culture. so cool, that's awesome. Yeah, it really is cool. It's very cool. I'm excited. I love to talk. I love to talk about that. So yeah, please go over and check us out. All right. And we'll definitely post the, uh, the link, uh, to that in the show notes for Thank this you. episode. Um, Lori, can, I'm going to ask you, um, a, a quick couple questions before I let you go. Um, mm -hmm. what is your, how do you manage your calendar? I manage my calendar. I have a, I have a couple things. I use Google calendar didn't use a Google Calendar, did not want to use Google Calendar, but I use Google Calendar because I can, it can be accessed with my team and it can be accessed from other people. Um, so I, that's the calendar that I use. And my calendar is incredibly colorful. And you, cause you can create, I'm very visual, so you can create all these different colors in your calendar. Um, so that's, I use it. The other thing that I do, and I'm just gonna pull something up here. I can show it to you. This is an old nursing trick. This is called your brains. Every week, I print out my week from my Google Calendar. Is it always uh, a, on a bright green piece of paper? It is. Okay. It is. This is a very ugly piece of paper, but it's on this bright green piece of paper because it's not going to get lost on my desk anywhere. This is the only thing that I print out on this paper. And I print out my calendar. If you'll notice sort of what's happening here is it, it's already showing the major appointments that I have, right? So I actually look at this on Sunday night and it shows the major appointments I have. But also here we are probably around what we are Wednesday or Thursday. You can see that I've written on it, I've crossed things out. I might've put a list on, I have team meetings on certain days. I start writing notes to myself. 
it becomes a working a working calendar. Um, also on the back, I may take notes about something. Sometimes it's a phone call's come in. If I have to return a phone call, um, I, I write things on the back. I may also, on these calendars, another tool that I use, I, don't, I must have done really well last night because I didn't have any. I have certain Post-it notes, only these Post-it notes. I think I, I bought, like I've a stash of about 20 of these. these you are, know, they're a star. Notes. They're a star. And I saw them go on clearance one time at Staples and I started to panic that like they were going out of this particular this particular uh, you know shape and color, but it's again an obnoxious color. I have no idea what people do with pale pink post-it notes. They just don't do it for me. But whenever I I need to remember something, in addition, I may put it on a post-it note. And whenever I see that, that tells me this is something that you have to do. So at the end of the week, it also it so and this is what I'm looking at all the time. I can go to my calendar, see the bigger picture, um, and I do that quite a bit. But I I am constantly updating this as my, my go-to during the day and go-to during the week. And then it also goes in a file system uh, on, a, you know, sort of in a, in a, so that if I need to go back, I forgot something, I can go back and take a look at that. Very cool. You know, if you, uh, if you use Evernote, you can use their document camera and it actually does a pretty good job at actually uh, being able to search your handwriting and you can search for it that way. Oh, Wow. I, you know, I'm also a big believer, believer in planners because I've looked at Evernote is that you need to have one, what I call the master planner, yep. right? One master planner. And if I try and divide my stuff into too many, or most people, we think, okay, well, planner for this, for that, or for this makes sense, but it really makes it really it does it because you're in the middle, yeah. everything has to come to you. So it's, right. no, right. yeah, absolutely. I have, you know, I work with people that, and you do too, I'm sure that have, um, you know, four or five different calendars, their, their calendar, the family calendar, their spouse's calendar, their doctor's calendar, and a, a tool like Google Calendar can put them all in one oh, place yes. and you can see them all. There's no double booking um, and printing it out like this. I'm a very, also very tactile person. A tool, this tool is what I, what I learned when I was in, when I, when I worked as a nurse, because just like we have to do during the day and everybody has this is that we have several things to do during the day. A lot of things are shifting and we have to remember it a lot. So what, what nurses do is they really m document when and where they have to be doing things because it can be multiple things at one time. So they used to call the best their brains. And ever since I've been a coach, I've just sort of continued with that practice and hold that uh, up for one more second. I'm going to take a quick screenshot of that and then I'll uh, post I that. Know if there's any Let's see. And I'll, and I'll make sure that if there's anything that's like uh, sensitive data, I blur it out. I don't think there is. Okay. I don't uh, know. Just so we can get the, uh, uh, just so people can see kind of what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It's really just a black and white printed off of the Google calendar. Um, I can go in and highlight with highlighters if I want. Um, you, you have to, you know, save it, 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 save it as a document. And then I put it in a landscape mode, but this works super for me. Cool. Well, and I do it. That's, Thanks that's, for sharing that. That's how I run the empire. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we got to have lots of, of strategies uh, mm -hmm. know, in place and systems for for yep. doing, you know, for, for doing the things that we're doing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Laurie, thank you so much for, for spending the time with ADHD Rewired. Um, as I always like to say uh, that you just helped the rest of the community get their ADHD Rewired. Give us our URL, your URL one more time and how people can reach you. Yes. Um, you can reach me at the IACCenter.com. That's I-A-C-T center.com. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Larry. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictippers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictippers.com slash Audible. 
Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewire.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.